All right. We're recording now. All right, guys. I got um, I got a PowerPoint I'm going to show you again, but um, <coughs> we're going to talk about kingdom expansion this evening for just a little bit. Kingdom expansion. So if you've got your Bible, go over in your Bible in the book of Matthew chapter 16. Matthew, the 16th chapter. I think this is one, probably one of my uh, most favorite uh, groups of scripture to read, just to consider, just to think about, just to kind of uh, let the Spirit of God uh, mull things over. Uh, There's a scripture that when you see it, it's not going to be very unfamiliar to you. Um, it's one of my favorite groups of scripture to, to, uh, to look at and give us an idea of some things to talk about this evening. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Let's look from verse 13 all the way over through verse number 19. 13 to 19. And this is what the scripture says. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So um, that is one of the little sets of scripture that I like to look at from time to time, some of my favorites. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen so we can look at this PowerPoint together. And uh, there we go. Can you guys see my screen okay? I see SpongeBob. Yeah. You see SpongeBob. Oh, there we go. There we go. He's gone. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. So um, the kingdom expansion is what we want to talk about. And uh, what I put on the first part of uh, this particular PowerPoint was not the entirety of the scripture that we just read. Just uh, verses uh, uh, 18 and 19 uh, is what I put on the PowerPoint for us to look at uh, together and then um, talk about uh, some keys, the keys to kingdom expansion. Um, again, you see it on your screen there. You know, Jesus said to Peter that uh, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And we know that, you know, uh, art of the prayer that um that we that we pray from time to time and some of us have done this on a sports field or in a setting like that you know we pray the lord's prayer <laughs> thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven um i think a good majority of guys my age guys i don't know about younger guys i'm sure older guys did it but anytime I was playing softball, we all gathered out at the out at the pitcher's mound, and we all, you know, put our hands in a pile in there, and we all quoted the Lord's Prayer before we ever got involved in a in a softball game. That was years and years and years ago. I can't play softball anymore because I'm too competitive, and I just know that it's my spiritual kryptonite, so I don't get close to it. I like to cheer the guys on that play it, but I, I just I don't like to get involved in it anymore because it, it creates uh, – it creates uh, a reaction that's not very pleasing to me. So I just kind of let that thing go. But we pray that prayer, you know, Lord, your will be done. Even now we pray it in our life. I'm not sure if you pray this whenever you pray and 
we've heard this prayed in church, you know, Lord, your will be done. Let your will be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven. That kind of ties in with uh, what Jesus is telling Peter when he's telling him he's going to give him the keys to the kingdom because he makes this statement that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Um, there was a, a pastor that I sat under years ago that uh, we talked about this particular set of scripture uh, together and I, I asked him the question, you know, how, how does, how is that possible? How, how can we bind something here and bind it in heaven and loose something here and loose it in heaven? And, you know, cause it was, that was back in my early days of Christendom where you read scripture like this and you don't understand what it means. And you kind of like, I want to figure out what, what is, what, what is the intention of this? And uh, the way it was explained to me, and maybe you guys may have thought about this before and you may have some insight on this. Someone, someone may have shared information with you on this, but the way it was shared with me was that when you become a child of the Lord, whenever you become a child of Christ, begun, begin to walk in alignment with him and walk in unison with him and understand that he has given you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. When the scripture says that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, what, it, what the writer was saying, what was explained to me was that when you are so, so closely related to Christ, the things that have already been bound in heaven, then you will bind those things on the earth. And whatever has already been loosed in heaven, if you follow in Christ and following closely with Christ, then you will loose those things in the earth. It's not like you are binding and loosing. You are walking in unison with Christ that you understand what's already, what's already happened in the heavens, what's already been bound in the heavens, and what's already, already been loosed in the heavens. Then it, is, it becomes the spiritual activation in your life that you see those, those same things being bound and loosed in the earth. Does that make sense? Has anybody thought about that particular scripture or that saying in scripture or anybody have any other insight on, has anybody shared anything like that with you guys as it relates to that particular portion of these scriptures? Not me. <laughs> I mean, nobody else is saying anything, so. <laughs> well, that's just something to think about. Because when you think about the scripture here, about the kingdom of heaven, things are bound, things are loose. We know that it's our, I won't say it's our responsibility or our job. It is our, what's the good word I want to use? It is our privilege to be able to be used in the hands of God to see the kingdom of heaven expanded upon the earth to see the think about the think about the kingdom of heaven think about the mindset of that kingdom think about the philosophy of that kingdom think about the the outlook of that kingdom think about the characteristics of that kingdom think about the qualities of that kingdom and to have the privilege to be involved in seeing all those things as it relates to heaven to see all those things come to pass or be expanded in the earth. That, that to, to me, that is a great privilege and a great honor to be involved in something such as that. Um, now, in this particular scripture reading here, he's having, this, he's having this conversation with his disciples, but he's actually having this particular portion of the conversation of the conversation with Peter, but it still applies to you and I as men of God today in the time that, that we are living. He tells Peter some, some bold things directly spoken to Peter, but those things that are spoken to Peter, we can see that those same things are adopted to the body of Christ or the bride of Christ or the church as we see it today because he says that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. You and I are part of that, of that building program or that church building today. So there are some things about this partic these particular uh, verse of scripture that kind of kind of lays the foundation. Then we're going to look at at um, at uh, five keys that Peter, who is being spoken to here, 
five keys that Peter used uh, to expand the kingdom of heaven in the day that he was alive, and it's all taken out of the book of Acts. Uh, so if you want to go it in your Bible, go ahead and go to Acts chapter 2 and just kind of hang out there for a little bit. We're going to go through a couple of chapters in Acts and see the different keys that Peter was able to put to use to see the expansion of the kingdom of heaven uh, active in his day. Uh, and it's quite frankly the same keys or examples of the same keys that you and I as men of God can use today. So just a couple of things to pull out of these little set of scripture. And if you want to say something, just somebody says something, start talking, I'll be quiet and, uh, and, and give you, uh, give you the microphone um, anytime during our time together. I don't want this to be a, a monologue. I want this to be a, a conversation. So um, the first thing that I realize on this particular set of scripture here, verse 18 and 19, it, you know, uh, Jesus says to Peter that you are Peter and upon this rock. Um, and some people have difficult, and I had difficulty at times trying to comprehend this too. What is he talking about? Is he going to build the church on Peter? Is he going to build the church on Peter's name? Is he going to build the church on, on, on Peter's mindset? Uh, he said, he said, he said, I, I say to you that you are Peter. And he said, on a, and, and upon this rock. And what he was referring to was the open revelation that Peter had just shared with him about who he is, uh, as it was revealed to him through the father. Remember, Jesus told Peter that flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who was in heaven, he said he was blessed and said that he would build the church, not, not on Peter, the little rock but the capital rock or the revelation of who Jesus is. So he is the foundation of the church. Um, and he is the rock and that rock represents an open revelation uh, to Peter about the person of Jesus. He says on this rock, he said, I'm going to build my church. This is where you and I get to be part of the process. You and I get to have the privilege of be involved in what's going to be taking place here. You know, he said, I'm going to build, he said, I'm going to build my church. It's a representation or representing a oneness through Christ. In other words, he didn't say, I'm going to build, I'm going to build this church and the other church and the Methodist and the Presbyterian and the Catholic and the Pentecostal church and the, the uh, church of God of prophecy and the assemblies. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't specify denominations. He specified he specified a bride. He said, I'm going to build my church, the people of God. And it, that his church is a representation of the oneness that we have uh, through Christ. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sure a lot of you guys have friends in your life that are part of the church, the, the, the big capital C church, but may not be a member of our branch of, of religion, the church of God. Um, and so having the privilege to be able to be considered, although we're from different religious backgrounds and different denominational structures, uh, there is still a oneness because we understand that we are a representation of Christ, that we are together in this thing. We, we, don't, we don't have, there's no uniformity here, uh, but there is unity, should be unity in the body of Christ, um, should be a oneness that we we are together in this. We're not working against one another, but we are working against the evil. We're working against the adversary. We're working together in unison to advance the kingdom of heaven on the earth. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Well, y'all. Well, what I was thinking of while you were talking about advancing the kingdom of, of heaven, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but as being a Christian, is it is it really that hard? I mean, like, does anybody else see an opportunity to share Jesus and don't? You know what I mean? Uh, uh, like, you're almost, it's like kind of hard to do. Am I the only one that feels that way, that it's kind of hard at times to to share Jesus with people? No, I think we've all been, we've all been on that path, been on that road. We've all, I think we've all, if we're honest, we've all experienced that. Um, I think the difficulty is, is it, 
is it difficult because we feel the spirit um, refraining us from sharing or is it difficult be because we feel we feel the fear of sharing uh, and it could be a, a time it could be a time where the spirit actually keeps us from sharing but there are but it also could be that we ourselves our flesh um, is hindering our abilities to share uh, that's just my that's just my perspective these other guys may have a different perspective than that I was gonna say yes Bill you're the only one <laughs> 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 well, yeah, I think what pastor said is true. I mean, and I know, I, you know, part of it, I, I, in my own life, I attribute it to my personality, you know, I'm an introvert. And so, you know, it's, it's a challenge for me to, you know, especially someone I don't know that well, that explains to, a lot, yeah. in, you know, engage in conversation. <laughs> so, you know, I, it is, you know, I think it, it, it is a challenge. And for some people, it comes more natural, I think, you know, you're extroverts. Yeah. There's certain people that it's, it's very easy for them to do that. But I think for a lot of people, um, myself included, you know, even though I've been a, a Christian for a very long time, I definitely find it challenging. But see, I always see, seem that I have an opportunity at work, especially with the people that I work with. But me being a quiet, meek kind of guy, you know, oh. it's hard for me to uh, say anything, you know, to people. <laughs> yeah, we're going to pray for you in just a minute, brother. <laughs> we're we're going to pray for humility there, Bill. <laughs> yeah. I, I know to go along with what Jeff's saying, I know for me and my personality, I'm, I'm a problem solver. I like to fix problems. And what's always been kind of my hindrance is, what if someone asks me a question and I feel like I need to be the answer or give the answer that I may or may not know. And the hard part that I still struggle with even to this day is I'm not going to know all the answers. I just need to be upfront and honest with them and go, you know what, if I get asked a question, say, honestly, I don't know, but I can find out for you and be intentional getting back to them. But for me, my personality is I start overanalyzing things. You hear the spirit tell you, hey, why don't you just talk to that person and be like, what if they ask me this? What if they ask me that? I don't know this. And you shoot yourself down and it matches your personality so often. Like Jeff said, by nature, an introvert is going to be like, you want me to do what? But a person who's a problem solver goes, well, what if they ask me this? I don't know the answer. Yeah. And, and there's definitely a fear of rejection, you know, that, you know, we have yeah. this innate uh, humanity that we want to be accepted. And so, you know, and again, you know, some people don't care as much as others, but most people care about being accepted. And so just the fear of when you do share, you're taking a risk. Yeah. And the risk, one of the risks is rejection. So, you know, and that, that's a very real fear. I think, you know, back in the day, uh, some years ago, I think people were more focused on not necessarily sharing Christ or sharing the kingdom as they were at sharing the church, their church, little c church. Yeah. Um, when it relates to the kingdom, now of course, share Graceway, talk about Graceway, but I think the the primary focus needs to be on the the ability to share um, information as it relates to the kingdom of heaven and the person of Christ, whether we ever get to share anything about the lowercase c or or not. Um, I think back in the day, people were that was their main priority, main objective was to talk about the church, the lower C. And they, they neglected talking about the, the capital C or the kingdom. Um, we get so, how can I, we get so institutionalized and we only want to talk about things that, that are beholden to us, you know, our doctrine, our mantra, our, our, you know, philosophies, our uh, declaration, you know, our principles. And those are good things to talk about, but n those things may not draw somebody <laughs> into the kingdom. Uh, and so our intention should be drawing people into the kingdom, uh, not necessarily drawing them into the lower lower seat church. Does that make sense? Bill, does that kind of yeah. help you a little bit? Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes when you, when you actually share, when you share your testimony, it, it, I mean, that always helps too. It, it make it easier to uh, to share your faith in, in Christ. Right. 
it's a matter of also being real. Because like you were saying, when the capital C and little c, one thing you always run into a lot of times is like you said, they, when you, is it more of a script or is it you being real? Yeah. You're not the one that's going to save them. You may be planting the seed. God's going to be the one that's actually is doing, doing the action. You're just being that seed planter. Right. And so often we're like, man, I got to go out and I got to start browbeating people. I got to be a preacher. I got to do this. No, you just need to be real. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the phrase here that he said, he said, I'm going to build my church is a represent is represented a oneness through Christ. Then he makes this declaration. He says, and the gates of Hades, or if you look in the uh, King James, I believe it has the word hell or Sheol means the same thing. Uh, the gates of hell, um, which means even when we find ourselves walking in unison, walking together, advancing the kingdom, we're all going to force, we're all going to face, I'm sorry, we're all going to face forces of opposition. You're going to face personalities and or persons and or mindsets and or philosophies uh, that are not going to agree, not going to align, not going to enjoy uh, what is being what is being shared or what's being uh, you know lived out. Um, but it, that that shouldn't that should having a, having difficulty with with people. <laughs> Or finding it difficult uh, when you're sharing with people, uh, finding it difficult having to interact with the with the opposition that's there. Uh, we just need to realize that that's been since the beginning. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not just for us in the now. It's always been that way uh, from the days that Christ is talking to Peter about this and, and says the gates of hell will not re will not. Uh, will not be able to stand against her, will not, not be able to dethrone her, not, will not be able to stop the forward movement, but we're still going to force, we're still going to face forces of opposition. Um, that's what the gates of hell or the gates of Hades represent, represents forces of opposition. Um, and it could be, it could be forces, external forces, or, could, or it could be the forces on the inside of us that tries to that tries to um, stop the the forward movement or the forward momentum or the advancing forward of the kingdom. So, but then he says, after all, he says, he says, I will give, uh, which is a representation of a continuation. Um, he said, I, in other words, um, uh, how can you say? It's, kind of, it's almost like a it's almost like a, a runner that's running. Uh, a marathon or those what do you call them uh, those four by 100 medleys or whatever you got four runners out there and the one runner can't leave and the next runner gets into the little lane there and then they run together for a little bit and then they pass the baton and then the one runner stops running and the other runner keeps on going really that's almost, that's almost what this is relay race. huh relay, relay race relay yeah, like relay race. race yeah that's that's almost what this is representing. It's a continuum. <laughs> well, I thought you were talking about shoplifting. Shoplifting. <laughs> no, oh, no, not shoplifting. Well, now we know where Joe's going. Yeah, yeah. going to the store. I don't know where I've been. <laughs> yeah. <I'm just> kidding. <laughs> nice going, Winona. Situation. No, yeah. what Jesus. What Jesus started, He wants us to continue. What Jesus is starting with Peter, He wants Peter to understand that He is going to be use for the continuation of that even as it relates to the to the um uh to the um the, the uh the great commission of christ you know he says he wants us to go out and make disciples and teach them and baptize them a continuation of the ministry that he already had uh active on the earth he wants to he wants to continue that so when when i read the words here i will give it's almost like a passing of a of a baton or the passing of the torch uh, it's almost like, here we go. I, I don't know if I was going to say this or not, but I am. I'm reading a book right now. Where'd my, where'd my picture go? I can't even see myself. I'm reading a book now that is written by Brian Cutshaw, if you can see it or not, Bows and Arrows. He talks about generations working together. One generation, one generation um, passing the baton or passing the torch to the next generation coming so that it doesn't stop. It keeps going. It keeps perpetuating itself. You know, the kingdom of heaven has been around for thousands of years. And so it's our privilege to be able to be used in that vein to see it expanding 
during our time of living here on the earth. I'm trying, I'm almost feel, <laughs> I almost feel like jumping out of this chair. Um, but it's a continuation. It's a, it's a thing that's going to be. Don't stop here. It's not going to, well, I'm trying to stay right here where I can keep teaching, but I feel that preaching spirit coming. Um, it's a continuation. Of, <laughs> it's a continuation of what he's already, what he's already instituted. He says, I'm going to give. It's a continuation. What he's going to give, he says, as I'm going to give, I'm going to give it to you. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a personal application. That's where I want us to see ourselves in Scripture. When I read, when I read stories like this, uh, paracopy of Scripture like this, groups of Scriptures like this, I try to see how I fit into that, uh, into that Scripture. How do I fit into what's being said? How do I fit into the conversation that, that Christ is having with who he, whoever he's having it with? You know, how, how can I find myself fitting into that? And when I read this, I, I see that it's a personal application. Although he's talking to Peter, who is a representation of the church, he's also talking to you and I. So we can see this as a personal application in our life. He said, I'm going to give you uh, specifically, individually, personally, you, not you know him, her, them, they, but you. He said, I'm going to give you... He's going to give you something. What's he going to give you? He's going to give you the keys to the kingdom. He's going to give you something that's valuable. He's going to give you something that displays or represents the authority. He's going to, it's kind of like this. I shared this before. I don't know if I've, if I've taught on this lesson or taught about keys before, but keys represent authority. In other words, the key to my car means I've got the authority to drive that car. The key to my house means I've got the authority to unlock the door and go into the house. If I don't have the key, I don't have the authority. I've got a key to the student parsonage. But, you know, when tomorrow or Friday when, when Pastor Alicia shows up, I'll still have a key, but that, that will be the house that she's in. So the authority or access to that house will be, it'll be her responsibility. Although I do have a key, I'm not going to use that key. Although we have a copy of the key here in the office, we're not going to use that key unless something happens and we need to get in an emergency. But, you know, keys... Uh, shows the authority for having access to something. So he says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, not keys to a car or keys to a house or keys to a boat or keys to, you know, whatever. But he says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Man, what a great, rep what a great representation of the authority that Christ has given his bride. Christ has given his sons and daughters. Christ has given his church. He has given us the keys to the kingdom or the authority of the kingdom. Think about that. Amen. Amen. Somebody say something. Amen. Any thought? Anybody got any thoughts on that? Keys to the kingdom. It's a humbling and daunting challenge all in one. Bigger. I mean, keys to a house is one thing. Keys, keys to a car is something else. He's talking about keys to the kingdom. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the characteristics. He's talking about the, the traits. He's talking about the mindset. He's talking about the, the, uh, the qualities. He's talking about Listen, he's talking about what we strive to get to. He says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, the authority to exercise. Here we go to the next one. I was, and I just want to say real quick, you know, there's, there's a great responsibility. Yes, exactly. You know, when, I give, when I give keys to my boys to one of the cars, you know, there's a, you know, I'm giving them the authority to drive the car, but there's also a responsibility that they have to, to take care of the car, to drive, you know, in a safe manner, right. et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, when, when God gives us the keys of the kingdom, I mean, we have the authority, but we also have a responsibility, um, you know, which is laid out in scripture, what that all entails, but it's, you know, and as Nate kind of alluded to, you know, that's kind of this, what was it? What was the word you used, Nate? It's kind of a humbling but daunting challenge. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that daunting aspect to it. That you know, I don't want to mess this up. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Oh yeah, 
Because, because, go ahead. I think the difference can also be between having the keys to a place that you rent and keys to a place they hand you the deed. Uh huh. And that's like the kingdom of God. I mean, not just we're possessing it. It's it's promised through Christ. Right. It's not, it's not a rental agreement. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, yeah. it's not temporary. No. And, and just think, you know, who, he's talking to his disciples. He's not talking to the crowd. He's not talking to the multitude. He's talking to these guys that have spent time with him, that have been come, that have become intimate with him, that have that have seen him during the most difficult of days, and have seen him at the at the peak or the height uh, of, of what he's doing. So they've been with him through all those different all those different seasons of the years that, that he walked with them. These are the guys he's talking to. He said, "I'm going to think about that. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you something that." That although everybody else may want it, to use the phrase from Pastor Jeff, everybody else may want it, but they can't handle the responsibility. Of it. They can't handle what they can't handle the, the responsibility that comes with it, and to be given that, with that understanding, man, that is a um, humbling. Nate is humbling, but man, it's also like a uh, like a jolt of lightning in your spirit. It's like, man, he's trusted me with this. So, you know, for me, here, here's the challenge. Oh, I'm trying to stay calm. Stay calm. You don't need to. <laughs> the challenge is how, how <laughs> in the world can, can I possess the, the, the authority? How can I have that? I didn't take it. It was given to me. How can I take that authority and then drop it? How can I take that responsibility and then let go of it? That's a challenge. That's where we find ourselves today in the 21st century. That I think many yeah. times, many times the church, not the little church, but the capital C church, I think, I think at times we have we have let go of the responsibility and the authority of the keys that we've been handed. Yeah. Just a thought. I, I guess I guess why. I guess too, um, you know, it says seek ye first the kingdom of God, you know, and his uh, uh, righteousness and, and all these things uh, would be added on to you. So. Right. I mean, I even think back to even just as recently as what's been going on the last couple of months, how many churches I've spoken. I, I like my job because I get to talk to different people from all different walks of life and yeah. different. And just talking with people and the people I ran across who their church just shut down. They did no virtual. They did no Facebook. They did no contacts, nothing versus other <laughs> churches who they had to do an upstart creating a whole Facebook live and doing all this. Those were the ones that were given the keys and have the keys, but they're making the best of what they can versus the ones that took the keys and put them in the drawers until this was done and over with. Yeah. It's a daunting task, but if he came down and from deity to humanity and did what he did, and if twelve fish well fishermen changed the world with their with his power, how much more can we as Christians can get, get done yeah. if we just did it? Yeah, so that's the challenge is just doing it. Because we have them, he's he's given them to us. We'll see a little bit. We'll yeah. see in in the next little bit. We'll talk about the keys specifically the keys that Peter used kind of helps kind of build the, the thing up because I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. And then he's, then he says, you know, I won't read the whole thing. I'll just read what's on your screen there. Whatever we bind or loose represents spiritual activation. Remember I said the way it was just way it was described to me was that whatever, whatever, what has already been bound in heaven or loosed in heaven is what, we need to see activated on the earth. What's already been bound needs to be bound in the realm that you and I occupy now. Uh, we're not binding anything new or loosening anything new. Anything that's that's being bound or loosened has already been bound or loose in heaven. We're just seeing it manifest in the realm that you and I find ourselves operating in today, in this in this physical realm that that we call life. Um, not to go out here and just start declaring things bound and declaring things loose. Just 
you know, speaking craziness or just some off the wall, off the cup type stuff, but really walking that close with Christ that you know what's already happened in the heavens. You know, Lord, let your will be done on earth here as it's already been done in heaven. Things that's already been bound and loose. Let us see those things uh, manifest. Let us see those that activation taking place <coughs> where you and I find ourselves today. So whatever you bind on heaven, we bound in earth. Whatever you loose in heaven, be loose on earth. Uh, that spiritual activation, that kind of, um, you know, we're getting ready to come into Pentecost Sunday. I'm trying to, I want to take a, uh, I know what people are expecting on Pentecost Sunday. I, I'm on a, I want to share, but I want to share it in a different way. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to share it in a way that we we become accustomed to. Uh, same phrase, same scripture, same thought, same delivery. Uh, one thing about I'm just going to be honest with you guys. There's one thing about pastoring and preaching on special occasions like Mother's Day, Father's Day. You know, uh, those special Easter and Christmas. It's like you know, what else can you say? How can you say what's not already been said? You know. Jesus is still going. He's still going to die. Uh, he's he's not getting off the cross. Easter, he's still going to die. Or, or Good Friday, still going to die. Easter, he's still going. He's still going to raise from the dead. Christmas, you know, the birth of Christ. He's still going to be born. He's still going to be wrapped in in strips of cloth. He's still going to be laid in a manger. He's not going to be taken into the end. So the story doesn't change. So the challenges on these special days like this that, you know, people get so accustomed to hearing it and try to present that in, in a different way or from a different uh, viewpoint. And so, you know, this spiritual activation, I think that in the day in which you and I live, we are living. I, I think I, I, somebody said it probably, I, I probably heard this phrase a uh, hundred million times. You know, we are living in unusual days or unprecedented days or, we are living in days uh, like never before, you know, unknown days because of this COVID-19 and whatever else you want to assign to it. And we are, we are living in a different day today than we were, you know, three months ago and a different mindset today than three months ago and different ways of thinking and, and maneuvering than we were three months ago. But the spirit, the spiritual aspect is that, his spirit and what he desires to do doesn't change depending on society or doesn't change depending on a crisis. It doesn't change depending on wear a mask, wear a glove, wear whatever, you know, stay at home. The spiritual activation doesn't change. It doesn't, it's not affected by the tides that affect us. And so trying to see this spiritual activation Especially today, um, we can see, we can see, hopefully, we can see the Spirit of God moving in what we would consider a new way only because we're having to look at the way He's moving through a different <laughs> lens or a different perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, you know, He's talking about, you know, binding and loosening, He's talking about spiritual activation. Uh, you know, this is what this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you, how I want you to 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 propagate the gospel so that the kingdom. Here we go, get back to the kingdom, so the kingdom can be expanded. Not, not, uh, not, not a man's fame or fortune, not a man's name, but the kingdom. Everything is focused on the kingdom. So here are five keys. Five keys in the next little, couple minutes we've got together. That was the foundation. Here comes the here comes the lesson. About twenty minutes long, I think it'll be. <laughs> <laughs> I got to copyright that. <laughs> that. Might be worth some money. <laughs> um, but uh, five keys to kingdom expansion. Using Peter as our example, realizing you know what Jesus has just told Peter. He said, "I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind, whatever you loose." And uh, so five. The first key is this: it's the key of the gospel message that's found in, in Acts chapter 2 verse 41. If you got your Bible still open to, to the book of Acts, you can go there and this is what it says. Now we know this is taking place you know on the day of Pentecost after the, the spirit has showed up and the wind has blown and the tongues of fire have fallen and the men have gathered and 
They come out of this upper room experience. Verse 41 says, then those who gladly received his word, talking about Peter. Now, Peter's preached the gospel, the good news. Those that received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So we see the key to the gospel message. And we see what it, what it was used for. It was used to loose the chain of unbelief. That key is still, is still in effect today. The message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, um, that is what takes the chain of unbelief away so that men and women, boys and girls, unbelievers can come into the kingdom, can be brought into the kingdom, expanding the kingdom of heaven through the gospel, through the key of the gospel message. Anybody got any thoughts on that? No thoughts. Bill's shaking his head. He's eating dinner. Hey, Bob. Hello. I didn't see you pop in on us. Yeah, I was uh, in the middle of a project, so I came in late. Are you home? Yep. Oh, cool. Trip okay? Oh, yeah. Terrific. Good deal. I'm glad you're back. I'm sure you're glad you're back too. In a way. <laughs> All right, let's go. That, that's key number one. Here comes key number two. Key number two is the key of healing. The key of healing. Acts chapter three, verses six through nine. Uh, this is, of course, the story. And if you got your Bible, you can flip to it real quick. This is a story of Peter uh, and John. Uh, making their way into the temple about the hour of prayer. Um, the Bible says that Peter, verse 6 through 9, Acts chapter 3, then Peter said, talking to the lame man, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. What's Peter got? What's Peter got? Peter's got the keys. Peter's got the keys to kingdom expansion. Peter says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I can give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him up by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Peter is using the key of healing, divine healing, key, part of the keys to the kingdom. He's using this key now to defeat the chain of, of sickness, the key of healing. Yeah, has anybody? I, I'm try, I, I can't say all of you at one time. I can see most of you, but has anybody ever experienced divine healing in your life since becoming a follower of Christ? You see, Nate raised his hand. I got my palm up. Nobody else. Bill's got his hand up. Who's that? PJ's got his hand up. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's part of the atonement. It's a key to the kingdom. There is, there is a real, there is a real thing called divine healing, walking in divine help. And Peter used this key that he was given keys to the kingdom. He used this key to defeat the chain of sickness. Now here's a funny story. How many of you guys know, I'm gonna try to look again. How many of you guys know the, the TV evangelists? Of course, we're all TV evangelists now. But uh, a guy by the name of Jesse Duplantis. Does anybody, yeah. everybody know about that guy? Yep. Yeah. Yep. He um <laughs> years ago, good gracious, probably I heard it probably. That was you know, before my time, Pastor. Right. Well, look at Googling, brother. Googling. Um, probably it's been two. It's been twenty years ago. Nineteen, twenty years ago. Um, I was uh, at a home in Beaufort and was listening to him. Uh, I think it was on the radio. Um, he was talking about walking in divine help. And he, had, you know, he was talking about his own personal self now. He said from the time that, you know, he had been saved, that he was he was walking in divine help. And he would get up in the mornings and he would, he would quote scripture over his life as it relates to divine help and divine healing. He mentioned about the time that he would go to the, to the doctor's office to get his physical and get his checkup done. And, you know, the doctor would say, you ask him all those crazy, you know, uh, medical questions. You know, has anybody in your family got heart disease? Well, yes. Has anybody in your family got high blood pressure? Yes. Has anybody in your family got diabetes? Yes. Has anybody in your family got 
uh, all these other ailments and, and issues. And, you know, Jesse was saying, well, yes, and yes, and yes to this. And the doctor was trying to tell Jesse that because his, he has a family history of those things in his chronological family, that he, he would stand a greater chance of possibly having those same issues in his life, in his later years of life. He said, and Jess, I'm, I, won't, I won't quote it the way he said it, but I'll just kind of share the way it was intended, the way I heard it. Jesse became spiritually upset that this doctor was trying to tell him as a child of God because his mama or his daddy or his grandmama or his granddaddy had these physical illnesses that he was going to have those same illnesses. He said, he said, Doc, he said, I understand what you're telling me. He said, but I don't receive that. He said, I'm a blood, I am a blood bought, blood washed, Holy Ghost filled child of God, sinless blood courses through my veins. And he went into his, his preaching, you know, uh, vein of talking to people. He said, I don't, I don't receive that. I denounce that in the name of Jesus. He said, but he said, he said, Doc, how do you feel today? And the doc was telling me, you know, he wasn't feeling too good at that particular moment. Jesse said, let me pray for you. And so right there in the doctor's office with this doctor, telling Jesse, that he was going to be sick. Jesse said, no, I'm not because of the blood of Christ and because of who I am and who Christ is in me. As a matter of fact, because of who he is in me, if you're sick, I'm going to pray for you that you become well, that you become whole. The funny part of that story is that Jesse said, up until the day that he was talking about this issue, he had never been sick. He said, I got sick one day, but it wasn't, it wasn't cause, uh, it wasn't cause the, the spirit wasn't living inside of me. It was because I wasn't listening to the spirit. He said, I ate a can of, does anybody, everybody know what Vienna sausages are? Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Just, uh, a couple, just a couple of you. Vienna sausages, little bitty sausages that come in a can that have juice in them. It's almost like bologna, uh, not not this good, not this good Pennsylvania bologna, but like Oscar Mayer bologna. They're it's delicious. That kind of, it's that kind of makeup rolled up into a little wiener that's in a can, and preservatives are in there, and you know it can stay fresh for I don't know for a thousand years. I'm kidding, I don't know. But Jesse said he went to his cupboard and he he went to grab a can of Vienna sausage. And notice that the date, the expiration date had already come and gone. And he thought, hey, these are vinyl sausages. You know, they're preserved. They're good. He said, I ripped open the can and I ate, you know, half the can of vinyl sausage. You wasn't thinking about anything. He said, what? But a couple hours later, I was sick as a dog. He said, it wasn't because the spirit of God wasn't in me. It's because I didn't listen. So when, I, when you're talking about keys of healing, you know, it's not like I'm going to use the key, but I'm going to do whatever I want to do and then claim divine health. That's stupid. Um, I, you know, I, when I go to the cover to pick something out, I often look at the, is this thing expired? If it's expired, I'm going to use some common sense. I'm not going to eat it if it's expired. Uh, if I eat it uh, and then claim I've got the key of healing, I'm just an idiot. Um, does that make, does that make, that, hope that, sound too, that probably sounds too harsh, doesn't it? No. No. But it's kind of like you know, this funny story that Jesse said, you know, I've got the keys of the kingdom, key of healing, but I didn't listen to the spirit. I didn't listen to his prompting, and I ate this can of expired vinyl salt, and I got sick. It wasn't the spirit's fault. It wasn't because the spirit wasn't working. It's because I rejected to listen to what he was saying. So Peter used the key of healing to defeat the chain of sickness. Uh, we are living today in a world of all kind of illnesses, all kind of diseases, all kind of ailments and we're living in a day where if you watch television uh, any length of time you'll see all kind of crazy commercials come on for these different medications and different prescriptions and different pills that can take care of this that and this and that and this and that and we're living we live in a time where people are sick uh pill popping uh is an all-time high man open a cabinet you got all kind of crazy pills in there to take for all kind of crazy illness, illnesses and ailments, and we fail to realize, hey, we're in the kingdom of God, and in the kingdom of God, there is a key of divine healing, and we don't, we don't, we don't use it as often as we ha could have the the honor and the privilege. Not that we have it, but that He's given us that key to find scriptures of healing and to find 
uh, times of healing and to claim the blood of healing and to put that key into action. You can use the authority that that key represents, but also use it responsibly. Don't say, you know, I'm going to use the key of healing because I got sugar diabetes. I'm going to use the key of healing, but I'm going to go out here and eat me a dozen duck donuts rather than slather than all kind of crazy toppings and everything else under the sun. Sugar goes through the roof. You know, that's just being, that's not being responsible. But key two is the key of divine healing. Here we go. Key number three is the key of prayer. Acts chapter nine. Who's eating? That Pastor Joe? Hello. I guarantee it is. Where's he at? <laughs> it's your compass. He's uh, I, I, I thought he was walking in the woods. Oh, he might be. He has no talent. Some, some, not some like uh, chewing uh, uh, potato chip. Superman. There you go. But it's the key of prayer. Um, you know, go to Acts chapter 9 with me. If you, still got your Bible. you still got your Bible? Go to Acts chapter 9 with me. Key of prayer. <laughs> Y'all are now too, don't you? All right, I, I, I muted when I was eating chips. Now, who's eating chips? I think it's Pastor Joe. I just muted him. Oh, okay. He's walking. Yeah, he's walking. <laughs> yeah, I think it's him walking around. Walking around. Oh. Yeah. Sound like he was eating chips, man. I know. It. That's why I'm screaming. Look at him. The key of prayer. Acts yeah. chapter 9, huh? verse uh, 40 through 42. This is what it says. This is it's talking about, it's talking about uh, going down and the uh, young lady, uh, uh, Tabitha or Dorcas, as they called her, she was a maker of fine materials and she died. And uh, Peter shows up, and they're all beside themselves. They're sorrowful. They're crying because she's died. Uh, pick it up here in verse 40 of Acts chapter 9. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. What's that? And, and turning to the body, said, Tabitha, oh, you arise. Don't I don't worry about it. And she opened her eyes. I'm not going to be long. And when, she saw, I got a one and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand, lifted her up, and he had... And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed on the Lord because of the key of prayer. Um, and he used this key to overthrow the chain of death. Um, now, I'm not saying that we need to go down to the local funeral home and, and ask the funeral director where is the nearest body that's just been embalmed and go in there and have a 24-hour prayer vigil I'm not saying we need to do that, but I, what I am saying is that we do need to use the key of prayer um, to overthrow chains. And in this instance, it was a chain of death, but it's just the key of prayer. I think prayer, people think people think uh, of prayer as a last resort. Oh, I, there's nothing else I can do. All I can do, all I got left to do is to pray. Uh, has anybody ever heard someone say that before or just me? Yes, me. All I can do, all, all, all I got, all I can do is pray, as if, as if I'm at the. That's the end of my rope. I have nothing else to hold on to. When that should actually be our first response uh, against anything that may be trying to stand in the way of the advancement of the kingdom, whatever form yeah. it takes. Prayer should shouldn't be our last thought. It should be our first response. Probably from home. Bill, who are you talking to, brother? <laughs> I, no, I, nobody. I'm muted. No, no. You, I muted you. You were talking to somebody. You said um, at one o'clock. If I'm home. Um, well, I was praying oh, just okay. in case. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, Julie's standing. Julie's standing there next to me. That's all right. That's all right. Um, talk about, talk about the keys to the keys for kingdom expansion. The key of prayer. They tell me some of the books I've read about some of the early revivalists. I mean, you know, uh, talking about the, uh, uh, the Methodist brothers. I'm talking about guys that would go from region to region and from state to state and from area to area. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the tent preaching guys. I'm talking about, you know, I'm talking about Oral Roberts way back in the day. Some of you guys don't even know who Oral Roberts is. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, some Church of God ministers, uh, Tommy Tenney's daddy from way back in the day. I got you muted again. I'm going to unmute you. Hey, Julie. 
I'm talking about those guys that were coming into an area that were coming in for the purpose, sole purpose of preaching the gospel, for the sole purpose of, of, of presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ so that, that young boys and young girls and men and women could be saved and come into the kingdom. I'm talking about Billy Graham way a long time ago, uh, that they would send people in ahead of them to have times and seasons and moments and days of prayer before they showed up so that when they showed up, what they were doing for the glory of God and for the expansion of the kingdom would take place. They bathed those, those meetings in prayer. They bathed those, those tent revivals in prayer. They bathed those healing services in prayer so that when those things came, when it came to be time for those uh, events to take place, uh, we could, they could see the expansion or the, or the growing of the kingdom of God. So he used the key of prayer to overthrow the chain of death, but really the key of prayer can be used to overthrow any, any chain that would try to stifle or to, or to, to, to uh, stop the advancement of the kingdom. That's key number three. Here we go. Three more to go. Not really, just two. Key number four is the key of grace. The key of grace, Acts chapter 10, verse 34 through 36. What's happening here in the 10th chapter of Acts is that Peter is up on a rooftop, has a vision. Uh, there's, a, there's a delegation that's been sent from Cornelius' house uh, up to uh, Simon the Tanner um, uh, to get Peter to come back and to preach to them. Uh, the gospel. And so we see what's happening here in Acts chapter 10. Let's pick it up at verse 34 through 36. The Bible says, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Peter used the key of grace to open the door to the Gentiles. He's down at Cornelius' house talking to a group of Gentiles uh, about the gospel uh, 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 of Jesus and doing it in the spirit of grace, uh, realizing uh, who he is, Peter, who Peter is, realizing who Christ is, realizing who he's going to uh, be sent to minister to, and realizing who he's going to minister to them upon all of the person of grace, all the person of Jesus. So use this key to open up the door to the Gentiles, of which you and I are a part of that family today. You guys uh, got me? What'd you say, Nathaniel? You guys got me? We got you. You're right there. Yeah, well, my, well, the internet went on the fritz on my end. Well, I'm sorry. You're there. I, we still see you. All right. So we're part of the family of God because the grace the key of grace was used to open the door so that the <laughs> child could be, could be brought into the family. Same thing uh, happens today. Grace, you are saved by faith through grace, the key of grace. We could stay on grace for a, for a long time. We don't have that much time because I'm running short. Uh, get to the last key. I don't want to go past my 20-minute time period. Too late. Uh, it's key four. Here's key five. Key five is the key of faith. Go to Acts chapter 12 with me. Acts chapter 12. The key of faith. Here Peter's been thrown into prison. He's chained between two guards. The church has now secluded themselves in the house. And the church is praying. Peter's in prison. And the Spirit of God is fixing to move in Peter's life. Acts chapter 12, verse 5 through 10. This is what it says. It says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And here's where faith is in action. And so he did. The angel told Peter to gird himself up and tie on his shoes. 
<laughs> Peter responded, and he did. Listen to what it says. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real. But they came to the iron gate. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought he was seeing a vision. When it, and when they were past the first and the second guard's post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down, went down one street. And immediately the angel departed from him. It took faith for Peter to respond to what the angel said. It took faith for Peter to put on his shoes and his clothes. It took faith for Peter to follow after him. Even though Peter didn't know if it was real, he thought he was seeing a vision. Peter still responded in faith. And Peter used the key of faith to overcome the barrier of captivity. The key of faith. Man, we could preach on that. Woo we could preach on that for a month of Sundays, using the key of faith to overcome the barrier of captivity because we all have been held captive to some level uh, over the last couple of weeks. And I've been chomping at the bit to use the key of faith to overcome that barrier. And we did it this last, well, we did it two Sundays ago. We did it this last Sunday. And we're going to do it even more this coming Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. We're going to use the key of faith, open up the barrier, let the, cap, let the captives free and say the church doors are open. Okay, use your faith and come on in. Let's have church together. Somebody say amen. 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 That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about five keys to the kingdom. There they are right there in front of you. The key of the gospel message, the key of healing, the key of prayer, the key of grace, and the key of faith. Those are the keys. Now, there's more than just those, just those five. But those are, those are five of the keys of the kingdom that, that Christ gave to Peter. when He said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Now, it's up to you to use them and let the spirit activate through them. It's up to you to, to use the authority that they represent. It's up to you to be responsible and not let those keys go or lay those keys down or, 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 or throw those keys in a drawer somewhere, saving them for a rainy day. No, those are keys that we need to have active in our lives so we can see the expansion of the kingdom of heaven. Amen, amen, and amen. Here we go. This is the last little nugget, and then I'm going to leave you guys alone. So God wants and expects us, the church, to use the keys he's given to us. Not only those five keys, but these keys as well. The keys of praise, the keys of worship, the keys of prayer. I already talked about that one. And the keys of power. Praise, worship, prayer, and power. Additional keys on our key ring that we can use, specially activated today, to see the expansion of the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Y'all let me do all the talking. Y'all didn't hardly say nothing all the night. <laughs> I can't believe it. And it's look, it's early. It's 747. How about it? Somebody got any thoughts on that, on anything? Nobody got any thoughts on nothing? Just looking forward to Sunday. I'm just happy to be alive, ain't you? We're talking about kingdom expansion. The Sunday. Oh, speaking of Sunday, I gotta send, I gotta send Kira my my sermon title. You guys kingdom want to expansion. Okay? <laughs> what, I'm preaching on Sunday, what I'm preaching on Sunday is is the bride and the blessing. The bride and the blessing. Woo the bride and the blessing. It's gonna be good. That's hey, a me and Julie are, and she's the bride. That's right. <laughs> You're, she's the bride and you're the blessing. The blessing. I hear you. You should ask That's not her telling you, bless you, brother. Bless you. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, she went in. She was like, yeah, yeah, we saw that quick turn around. Not, well, she's not close enough to I'm kidding. She's not. <laughs> All right. Got that psycho uh, stance going. Yeah. Kingdom expansion. Sunday's coming. We're gonna talk about Pentecost Sunday, but from a different from a different viewpoint. So y'all pray for me. I got a couple of days to get everything tidied up, all the I's dotted and T's crossed. Um, pray for uh, Pastor Alicia. She is supposed to be coming up tomorrow and Friday, bringing all of her belongings, getting the part the, uh, the student parsonage set up, um, getting everything moved in. She's gonna be with us Sunday morning. So 
Um, Sunday will be her, her official first Sunday with us at Graceway. Uh, and then her first official work day will be actually uh, in the office Tuesday, it'll be June the 2nd. Um, but the so flea market starts Sunday. You'll be okay. <laughs> you'll be at church. I need you to help me out in the parking lot, brother. But the flea market. We got well, you <laughs> the flea market at one. I got my cool Trump hat there last week. Good deal. That thing was nice. I like to have one of those myself. Yeah, okay. Right. I'll get you one before church. <laughs> Bob, you look like you're in deep thought down there, man. No, no, I'm just listening. Just listening? All right. So be in prayer about those things. You know, my, my sermon finished up this uh, weekend, and then Alicia's coming, and, of course, Pentecost Sunday. That's that's a, a great day in the, in the life of the church. Uh so Sunday's going to be a good a good day, and Nate's got us a good a good uh, video he's going to show and and all that good stuff. The media team's doing a great job; they're learning new stuff up there. And so, hey, we're expanding. We're expanding. That's a good thing. All right. Well, if you guys got nothing else to say, I don't got anything else to say either. I've used all my words up. I Just prayed last know. week. You <laughs> 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 I don't know. It looks like Joe's lost in the woods. We're going to have to pray for him. Yeah, right. There's Sasquatch. Oh, wait, that's Joe. That big old bear. Get him. If, he, if, he drops the, if he drops the phone, we'll know what's happening. Hey, look, there's Sasquatch. Oh, no, wait. I had the phone in my ear so I could hear. Oh, wait, that, that's Joe. He's a, a Superman. He's, yeah. he's, he's hunting snakes. <laughs> hey, any uh, any horseshoe players out there, man? I I'm putting in a, a nice uh, sand and uh, horseshoe pit in the yard. No, man, we don't want no horseshoes. We we want um, cornhole. Like horseshoes. Cornhole. cornhole. Cornholes. Yeah, my sets at the church. Where are they at? In the shed there, oh. between the buildings. Now you I have to take them home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 